Just Welcome every everyone. Most of you here, Thanks for uh, coming to what promises to be a very, very exciting day. As you know from the schedule, we have three panels scheduled during the day and then a lecture after the last panel and then a reception. So I hope as many of you as possible will be able to stay through most of these <coughs> events. Uh, the first panel, uh, after the first panel, we'll have a short break. Uh, I also wanted to mention that, uh, as you know from the schedule, during the entire day, the Losang Samten will be continuing to work on the Tibetan San Mandala of Compassion, so uh, uh, I would urge you to drop by every now and again and take a look at that. Uh, before we get underway, uh, I really would like to make two introductions. Part of the excitement of this day, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Center for the Study of World Religions, is that we actually have two past directors here. And so I think you all know them, but uh, I would like to very, very briefly uh, introduce them and ask them to stand up and take a bow. Uh, the first is John Carmen, who's the Parkman Professor of Divinity and Comparative Religion Emeritus at HDS. He directed the center from 1973 to 1989. In the spring of 2009, Professor Carmen co-taught a course uh, with his CSWR senior visiting fellow, Dr. Vasant Rao of Andhra Christian Theological College <coughs> uh, on Christian-Hindu interaction in South Indian village society. And this was done in conjunction with a <coughs> restudy of five village Christian congregations that John uh, conducted was it 50 years ago, John? 50 years ago. So would John please stand up? And we're delighted that Larry Sullivan was able to uh, join us today from Notre Dame. He is professor of theology and concurrent professor of anthropology at the University of Notre Dame. From 1990 to 2003, he served as director of the CSWR and as professor of world religions here at the Divinity School. A specialist in the study of ritual in post-colonial settings, his acclaimed book, Kanju's Dream, A Drum, An Orientation to Meaning in South American Religions, won several best book awards, and his many contributions to the field of religious studies include his role as associate editor of the 16 volume Encyclopedia of Religion. So Larry, would you please stand up? As you know, the three panels uh, are, uh, that we're going to be participating in today are organized around the categories uh, World Religions, uh, Study, and Center. Uh, these categories, while they seem self-evident in one respect, were actually suggested to us as we thought about how we would organize the panels by Charlie Hallowey. So I'd like to thank, thank Charlie for that suggestion. Uh, my role here really is to introduce the chairs of the panels, and the cha panel chairs will then briefly introduce the panelists, uh, and then we'll proceed from there. So I'm delighted uh, that uh, Janet Gyatso uh, will be chairing our first panel this morning. She's the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies at HDS, with a special interest in Tibetan and South Asian religions, religious culture. Uh, her authored and edited books include Apparitions of the Self, The Secret Autobiographies of Tibetan Visionary, uh, in, in the Mirror of Memory, Reflections of Mindfulness and Remembrance in Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, and Women of Tibet. She's currently engaged in a major research project on traditional medical science in Tibet. In addition to her offerings in Buddhist studies, Professor Gyatso teaches courses in autobiography and religion representations of the female, and something that has been extremely important, as all of you know, I think, or most of you know, here at the Divinity School, uh, she teaches in the Buddhist arts of ministry. We're really greatly indebted <coughs> to Professor Gyatso for her leadership in founding and directing the Buddhist ministry program at HDS. And last, but perhaps not least, Janet has been on the CSWR Executive Council and serves on our advisory board. So, Janet. It's yours. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Maybe we can just sort of have introduction after introduction, and, and that'll, that'll do everything that we need to do. 
Anyway, good morning to everyone. Thank you for coming. And I also want to thank Don Swear and everybody else involved with it for giving me the honor of being one of the chairs of the panels. It's a great pleasure to be part of this 50th anniversary of the Center for the Study of World Religions that has done just so much. And I'm especially grateful to be able to chair the panel on world religions. Uh, I'd like to point out that we're starting almost 10 minutes late. And so hopefully we can slightly inch up, so not to shortchange this first panel. We have three speakers, and my thought was to have each of them speak and have a few minutes after each talk uh, to have a bit of uh, response and questions from the audience. And hopefully if they keep to, or I will make them keep to their 15, allotted 15 minutes, there will also be a bit of time at the end to reflect more generally on the issues that are raised. Uh, so our first speaker this morning is a PhD candidate now in the study of religion. This is Devika Premawardhana, and his uh, work is on the anthropology of Christianity in the global south. Uh, he's done a lot of interesting things already. He worked in Bahia, Brazil, with Christian and Afro-Brazilian religious communities. He already has a few publications. One of them is entitled Between Logocentrism and Lococentrism, Alan Brista Challenges to Traditional Theology, and he's also uh, is uh, working on an ethnographic essay on the religious practices of Cape Verdean migrants. So we're really uh, happy to have him be part of this event and looking forward to his remarks. Thank you, Professor Piazza. My grandfather, Cyril Kramawardena, was a Baptist theologian in Sri Lanka. As a principal of the Theological College of Lanka, the main Protestant seminary in the country, he developed something of a reputation for taking his students, all Protestant pastors in, the tra in training, off of campus and into the uh, local temples of this predominantly Buddhist country where they would sit uh, at the feet of the monks learning from them, this as part of their theological education. I never had the opportunity to know my grandfather uh, he passed away before I was born, but very interestingly, there, interestingly, there is somebody in this room who did, and that's Donald Swear. It so says something about your age, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I meant. Who, in the course of his own research in Sri Lanka and Buddhism, had the opportunity to know and to befriend my grandfather. Um, this is a fantastic coincidence that I only had the occasion to learn about after I had already become a student of Professor Swears, and after he had already become a very dear mentor to me, a relationship I can only imagine my grandfather would have delighted in knowing about. And uh, the um, reason that I bring up my grandfather and invoke his name, my ancestral spirit, is not only because I've come to learn in some of the communities where I not now do my work that one really doesn't begin anything without first acknowledging those who have gone before, but especially because I'm confident that his spirit, the spirit of your colleague and friend, joins mine in wishing you the heartiest of congratulations on this, which I know is in part a celebration of your career and recognition of your retirement from the directorship of CSWR. I also wish to thank you and the advisory board for this honor of the invitation to partake in this uh, anniversary celebration. Uh, I offer my talk this morning as a response to one of the questions uh, that was put to us, the specific questions, which is that about global Christianities related to uh, the topic of world religion. Wherever in the globe we look today alongside any of the religious traditions we study, there is likely strong evidence of what observers tend to call the southward shift of Christianity's <coughs> center of gravity. I want to raise some critical questions of one field that has emerged to study this, a field increasingly known as world Christianity. And given why we're all here, I wish to frame my assessment in terms of developments over the past 50 years in the study of world religions. Let me begin then manifesto-like, by declaring that a specter has long haunted the study of world religions, the specter of Christianity. The CSWR was established to study religious traditions whose most important quality was perhaps that they were all non-Christian. This was an urgently needed task, of course, at a time when the Christian tradition occupied not just center stage, but, um, in, in many, uh, but the only stage in many higher education curricula. The CSWR's creation for the sympathetic study of the religions of the world suggests the first of three important moments that I wish to note in the relationship between Christianity and world religions. 
the freeing of the latter from the often dismissive and denigrating gaze of the former. Before long, the problem of the relationship between Christianity and world religion shifted slightly from one of dismissal and denigration to one of distortion. The question arose of whether the very category of religion may reflect uniquely Christian preoccupations not shared universally. Here, Christianity is seen as relating to world religions not oppositionally as in the first moment, but by providing an un often unacknowledged template for what Orientalists constructed, looked for, and meant when they classified this or that set of phenomena as a world religion. A third moment in the relationship between Christianity and world religions suggests itself in the subtitle of Dana Roberts' recent publication out just last year, Christian Mission, How Christianity Became a World Religion. The argument is by now familiar where for most of the past two millennia it may have been excusable, although still quite incorrect, to think of Christianity as territorially bounded. That is patently not the case today. In 1900, two-thirds of the world's Christian population resided in Europe. By 2000, less than a quarter did. In that same 100-year period, Af uh, the African Christian population mushroomed from 10 million to almost 400 million. The CSWR came into being in the middle of that century, right at the tipping point, we might say, of this demographic sea change, the transformation of a predominantly Western religion into a truly world religion. I would like to suggest that precisely this latter development, what I have labeled the third moment in the relationship of Christianity to world religions, invites a re-examination of the first two moments. The first recall is evoked in the phrase sympathetic study of world religions. <coughs> Sympathy involved the bracketing of, here I quote from the CSWR deed of gift, critical evaluations of other faiths from the point of view of humanism, traditional Christianity, or any preconceived systematic analysis. There are two significant assumptions in this statement. First, a disjunction between humanism and traditional Christianity on the one hand and world religions on the other. Second, a mapping of that difference onto the opposition of the familiar and the strange. Explicit sympathy would not, after all, arise except, except to prevent misperceiving the strange through the lens of the familiar. This objective is commendable, no doubt, but not without its problems. By opposing traditional Christianity to the world religions, traditional Christianity plays the role of the familiar, but we rarely list untraditional Christianity among the unfamiliar, the world religions to be sympathetically studied. And so this leaves us with a relatively monolithic view of Christianity confined to, among other things, its modern Western expressions, an unwarranted reduction in any time period, but most certainly today. Given not only its presence, but its preponderance in the global south, Christianity can no longer be taken for granted as familiar. However, the illusion of familiarity is unhelpfully sustained, and here I want to raise first of several critiques of my field, by the way within world Christianity, uh, many within world Christian studies approach Christianity. I'm referring particularly to our pr preference for those Christianities most palatable to the liberal and secular sensibilities of ourselves in our academic setting. Intentionally or not, we sanction certain expressions and downplay others. Particular favorites are Latin American liberation theologies and Asian theologies of religious pluralism. Uh, these are the varieties of Christianity that induce, without much effort, the greatest amounts of sympathy. I'm not opposed to their study as I myself readily admit to championing them. I am, after all, my grandfather's grandson. However, I've come to ask myself, what about the experiences of Christianity coming from Latin America, Africa, and Asia that matter not to me, but to most Latin Americans, Africans, and Asians? What about those religious phenomena that strike rational intellectuals like ourselves as jarring, disturbing, or downright bizarre? Those, for example, that involve frenzied preachers and fire baptisms, those that take seriously the existence of demons and conduct ritual exorcisms, those that insist on exorbitant tithing in exchange for the blessings of health and wealth, those that claim to carry out spiritual warfare so as to conquer the world for Christ. How can we study such non-sympathy-inducing phenomena sympathetically? How can we allow space for what we dismiss often in Susan Harding's words as the culturally repugnant other or in Robert Orsi's as bad religion? 
These questions press on us urgently today as Christianity grows most explosively precisely in its Pentecostal and charismatic forms. And so for the first time perhaps in the history of the modern West, Christianity is predominantly to modern Western sensibilities exotic, every bit as strange and unfamiliar as the mystic East was ever imagined to be. If to free them from Western Christian biases was once reason enough to study world religions sympathetically, it now also gives reason to study world Christianities sympathetically. The second relationship I suggested between Christianity and world religions is the conceptual one, the caution against applying or imposing the category of religion uncritically across time and space finds its most acclaimed expression in expressions in the writings of Talal Assad. But Assad's own genealogy, he acknowledges, includes the CSWR zone, Wilfred Cantwell Smith. As early as 1962, Smith argued that the contingent roots of religion, particularly in Reformation era Europe, distort the very things the word presumes to describe. It reifies the otherwise elusive and multiplex profundities of faith, such that it becomes possible to speak of religions in the plural <coughs> as discrete, hermetically sealed entities, the conditions for what David Chittisel calls apartheid comparative religion. In the wake of the genealogical critiques of religion, what would it mean to speak, as Dana Robert does, of world Christianity as a world religion? Outside the West, although certainly inside as well, porous boundaries have long characterized Christian practice. A few examples. Jesuit missionaries like Matteo Ricci and Robert de Nobili in India, uh, Ricci in China and de Nobili in India, by translating the gospel into Confucian and Tamil terms, long ago demonstrated the futility of compartmentalizing customs and cosmologies into discrete, non-overlapping systems. Enslaved Africans, when forcibly transported across the Atlantic, creatively affiliated their deities with Catholic saints, giving rise to the highly syncretic traditions of Candomblé and Santeria and Voodoo. But even in the, most, in the least seem, uh, seemingly least accommodating, least flexible Christian expression, Pentecostalism, the intersecting and interpenetrating character of religions is also at play. In her fantastic study of the Ewe in southern Ghana, Birgit Meyer argues that ordinary Pentecostals, much to the consternation of their pastors, continue to affirm the reality of and relate meaningfully to the ancestral spirits they are supposed to reject and they do this precisely through their demonization. All these examples illustrate that Christianity as practice, uh, perhaps especially outside of Europe and North America, points up the limits of religion conceived as coherent and bounded like a system of beliefs. Which raises a question, if the coherent and bounded qualities of modern Western Christianity provide the template for world religions, can world Christianity be considered a world religion? I want to be careful not to argue that membership in a well-defined tradition or religion never matters to those who are Christian in post-colonial settings. As Webb Keen put it, when what Dutch Calvinist missionaries accomplished among the Sumbanis of Indonesia was not so much the inculcation of a new religious doctrine as the introduction of a new category of religion altogether. Keen's point is that even if uh, religion was not an indigenous concept before, the fact matters that matters, uh, that fact matters less than the question of how it nevertheless shapes self-understandings now. The point is well taken, yet I submit, it is still true that the largest growth in Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity is occurring right now among precisely those people whose customs, practices, and beliefs have never easily been translated by the word religion, a difficulty evidenced by the train of labels we have long used as alternatives paganism, heathenism, animism, ancestor worship, superstition, and all the rest. Ethnographic studies from contexts where such, studies, uh, such things are said to exist suggest that practitioners draw eclectically from the resources of Christianity and their traditions, more concerned with achieving some blessing, healing some ailment, or repaying some spiritual debt than with heeding the arbitrary borderlines where one religion ends and the next begins. Yet I recognize that for some the opposite is the case which calls attention to the need to hear particular voices. But whose voices are we hearing? It concerns me that much work in world Christianity disproportionately privileges the missionary in the mission encounter. Laman Sani, despite showing how translating the Bible creates conditions for what he calls indigenous agency, seems at times more intent on refuting the terrible caricature of the missionary imperialist than on revealing how Christianity is received and refashioned in everyday practice. 
since even the most context-sensitive missionary can never fully control the range of meanings of the local signs that get attached to Christian reference, translation leads to the destabilizing of the gospel itself. This outcome Sani fails to consider, assuming as he does, a one-to-one -one correspondence between local forms and missionary content. My sense, however, is that translating the message, the title of his seminal text, frequently ends up transforming the message. Birgit Meyer's study, again, is exemplary here for showing that when Pentecostal missionaries denounced a local deity by calling it the devil, this attribution didn't change the meaning of the local deity for the Ewe people as much as it changed the meaning of the devil. <laughs> Studies of missions rarely take note of such subversions because they rarely explore the everyday experiences of ordinary converts. Those that do reveal conversion as much different, being much different from the Pauline paradigm of renouncing all that came before in exchange for the supposedly stable and bounded content of Christianity. Jean and John Komarov suggest for this reason that the better word for conversion may be conversation. To get at these complexities, I in turn want to suggest that the better word for missiology may be conversiology. Not, to, uh, not, to, not the study of missions, but of conversions. Not the study of missionaries, but their targets, those who convert those who resist converting, and the many who lie in between. In this talk, my hope has been to explore um, how the CSWR can productively enter into debates on Christianities in the Global South. If it is true that Christianity has specter-like, long haunted the sympathetic study of world religions, it is also true that today it has ceased to lurk in the shadows of the places we go to study world religions. This global resurgence need not cause concern about a return to Christendom precisely because of what seems to me the nature of religion, conversion, and identity, particularly in the life worlds of non-elites. By focusing attention there, the CSWR can make its mark. It will require going beyond seeing Christianity in opposition to or as prototype for the world religions. It will also require more than simply reasserting Christianity in its newly global forms as being among the world religions. For as I've tried to illustrate with examples taken from outside the West, Christian and non-Christian religions have always intersected and interpenetrated. This suggests that instead of worrying about how to include Christianity among the world religions, we simply recognize that it already exists <coughs> within them and they within it. much for the really interesting talk. We have just a few moments, so if anyone would like to offer a comment or a question. Uh, uh, if, if we look at religious studies more broadly, rather than from a Christian studies and theological perspective, the, the increasingly important role that we might just say anthropology has played in this, if this sort of qualifies, or how, how, would, this, how would this be mapped into or folded into what you said? Um, well, I think that's... Uh, I wouldn't want to try to speak outside of the narrow field that I try to position myself, which is uh, world Christianity, but I think that the implications and much of what this whole critique kind of of the, uh, of the, of the of notion of boundary religion comes from observations, anthropological and historical, that have, uh, have been uh, very well observed and, and noted by scholars outside of many of the different traditions. And so what I think this uh, outside of, of Christianity, so in very many traditions. But so what I think that what this does for the field as a whole, if I can try to extrapolate from that, is to recognize that all of these different uh, traditions, they especially as lived, and I think that's the main point that it's, it, there's a distinction between thinking of them in their um, sort of abstract and, and more intellectualized forms, and there's a and 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 that of 
seeing how they're lived, appropriated, and, and make meaning and sense and uh, play a role in people's lives. As lived, the, the borders don't seem to matter, which is where I think it, it seems to be a, a very um, important way of perhaps bringing together a new way of thinking about the religious studies and the world religions paradigm. We, these are not discrete, bounded. They are always intersecting. Um, and certainly as Christianity continues to spread throughout the world, uh, that seems to be uh, increasingly the case. And perhaps I would say especially among those uh, little traditions, <coughs> the, the ones that um, uh, have really never had much of a place within the world religions pantheon, the paradigm there. And so, and perhaps because in part they haven't taken those textual forms that oftentimes make them very much conducive to being classified as a religion. I have another question or comment, if anyone cares to. I think you said it so well. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was great. Really, really Our second speaker, we're really delighted to have Stephen Hawkins uh, here with us today, who is indeed a um, graduate from the doctoral program here at Harvard in the Committee for the Study of Religion, uh, which happened in 1995. He earlier had a BA in English Literature uh, from the University of California and a uh, master's degree in Religious Studies from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, his field is South Indian devotional literature in both Sanskrit and Tamil, and he's had an enduring um, interest and work on, in particular, Vedanta Deshika of the 14th century. Uh, he has a number of wonderful books, um, including uh, a book entitled Singing the Body of God, the hymns of Vedanta Deshika in their South Indian tradition, which came out in 2002. Uh, another book entitled An Ornament for Jewels, Love Poems for the God Love of Gods of, uh, by, by Vedanta. Vedanta De Deshika, which came out in 2007. And he also uh, co-edited a book with John Carmen entitled Tracing Common Themes, uh, Comparative Courses in the Study of Religion. Uh, he is, has been engaged recently in a variety of projects um, on the themes of space, time, love, and memory. So uh, we're really happy to have you here today. It is really an honor for me to be here this morning, and I also have to do a bit of Guru Vandana. Uh, <laughs> I would have never gotten the job at Swarthmore College had it not been for Don Swear, a place I've been now for happily, uh, ecstatically now for uh, 17 years. I owe Don so much in terms of um, a model and a mentor. I would have never come to Harvard University or had my experience at the center had it not been for John Carmen, uh, uh, another uh, huge influence on my life. And I'll always be grateful to Larry Sullivan when my wife and my son and I came back from India after my first Fulbright to be allowed back into the center as a, in the new sort of regime of center fellows. And so, you know, uh, gratitude flows uh, to, to all of you here today. Um, I'm reminded by what you said immediately. Um, interesting, what I often do in terms of the defamiliarization of Christianity or Christian practice, um, Peter Brown's book, The Cult of the Saints, an amazing book. Um, all you have to do is read the early chapters of what Christian shrines were like. Uh, again, history is really important here for us to begin to dismantle um, the, the border lines between sort of rationalized, bounded, reified religions. It's a brilliant uh, few pages, and I often share that with my students. And they're just kind of, uh, kind of awestruck by, uh, you know, what would it be like to be in one of those shrines? Kind of sounds like being in a Hindu shrine. Sort of sounds like the ritual uh, richness of early Christianity. And also another thing that comes immediately to mind, and, and maybe a, it's a good thing for us to think about as we think about thematic comparison, religion on the ground, lived religiousness, rather than religion the religious, is uh, the work of Gregory Chopin, which I always have them read side by side. Uh, the Protestant presuppositions in the in the uh, study of early Buddhism. The concept of that we look at. Buddhism uh, in a way that's perhaps uh, too Protestant often, and we also, and historians have tended to emphasize a more Protestant point of view in, in, when uh, studying Christian, early Christianity. 
So these things are all important, I think, for us to, to think through uh, in, in a systematic way. And now we have the opportunity to think through in thinking about the center. And again, one more thing before I begin, a few remarks here uh, so I don't forget. And this is about communities at the center and also about the contribution of children. Um, I think we all have anecdotes. But my anecdote has a little bit to do with Zen Buddhism, but it's through the mouth of my five-year-old. Uh, it's after we came back from, from India, and uh, we were being walked around the center, shown the new, uh, I guess with the apartment turned into a seminar room. And we were walking around, and Victor um, Hori Roshi was here at that point. My son was there, my wife was there, I was there, a few other people. We were being walked through the new rooms of the center. I think we talked about Zen, I think we talked about Buddhism, God knows what the conversation was about. Uh, then at a certain point we retired to the common room and sat down and I could see that my son's face kind of, he was looking at Victor, you know, with great sort of interest, you know, they got to, you know. And at a certain point there was a silence and he opened his mouth and said, <laughs> and to this day my son doesn't quite remember it, nor does he remember that actually at one point he had Buddha mind, but he looked at him and he said, <laughs> I will, t you give me your mind, and then you will have no mind. <laughs> One of the great koans of my experience of uh, community at the center comes right out of the mouth of my, my son, and now my son and I are having long conversations about the meaning of life, and you know, dang it, he had it back then. <laughs> what happens to us? Um, I have a long piece here, but I want to just emphasize a few points, uh, of, uh, really of talking points. And in thinking about um, world religions and commenting on this, thinking about the center, what I did first actually is to go back to the word. You know, I'm, you know I don't want to get all kratalos on you, you know, but uh, you know, fanciful etymologies, etymologies of the word religo. It's a fascinating history in and of itself that Wilfred Cantwell Smith recounts in The Meaning and End of Religion. It has various valences. And one of the more, I think, positive valences, and a valence that uh, may uh, relate to our term study. You know, religion, study, and center are all sort of uh, encapsulated in many ways in the meaning of the term. Um, Cicero, or Kikudo's reading uh, of the word religare is to read over carefully, to go over, to gather up carefully, to read over and over again. The negative aspects of that definition have to do, of course, with over-scrupulousness. Uh, the, the notion that it gets superstitious, superstitio or religio, is a proper attitude of reverence towards something that is thought through carefully. And immediately I, uh, I thought in terms of this particular definition of religo um, as not only to bind back but to read over or gather up again uh, of our incoming director, Francis X. Clooney in his rich and suggestive nuanced readings of texts by Saint Francois de Sales and Vedanta Deshika and beyond compare, with an attentive eye on what emerges through a close reading encounter as distinctive but not disintegrated notions of loving surrender. Clooney also refers to the risk here of such reading, such encounter with others on the level of texts, being that betwixt and between space, where loyalties are made more difficult after learning across religious boundaries, the unpredictability of unruly double readings. This kind of, co this kind of encounter is a perhaps the most positive valence of the uh, meaning of the term religio uh, in all of its different uh, uh, vestments over the years, as it were. For most of the history of the term, of course, as we know from reading carefully Daniel Bayaran's uh, books or Denise Buell's wonderful study of early Christianity, Christianities and the sort of uh, crystallization, to use Wilford's, uh, Campbell Smith's words, of Christianity in the antiquity. It's been a negative term. Who has religion? Who doesn't? Our religion, their religions. Religion and the religions. For most of this history, religio is a way of, of uh, defining borders, of defining borders over and against, particularly by early Christians who use this term uh, and others. So the concept of religion as a kind of a divisive thing, as something that both separates and uh, binds together but separates, like a hinge, perhaps. Religo, also the con uh, concept with Augustine of return, or regresus, that religion is a religare, a binding back, a return to something. So for us at the center, I think, or thinking in a way, in a general way, about this term, which you might do, religio, 
returning to a source or center, for us perhaps to a point of mutual concord, a new mutual understanding by way of concentrated study. Going over, reading over carefully with others, I think also of the Hindu Upanishadic term nidhinyasana, which is a, a wonderfully uh, rich term and may be cognate to this, gathered around a center with an attitude of openness to what transcends us or simply to that end of religion we cannot yet individually imagine. Our religion itself may be aspirational, may have not yet arrived, not yet, be not yet fully present, though in such an encounter of persons uh, in a community, this kind of process can, can, can happen. Those are positive valences of religio and religion, uh, and I'm not going to, when I have a, a lot of detail about the historical sort of valences of these, uh, of this term. So what about the, the concept of world religions? And again, many of us know the recent work of Tomoko Mazuzawa on this, uh, the invention of, the, of world religions. It's a thesis that, of course, tr tries to uh, situate this term in a discursive practice that Mazuzawa argues <coughs> is something that spiritualizes what are material practices and turns them into expressions of something timeless and super historical which is to say it depoliticizes them. A, a concept of world religions that is invented in the European Academy, which becomes a way of differentiating, variegating, consolidating, and totalizing a large portion of social, cultural, and political practices observable among the inhabitants of regions elsewhere in the world. The thesis of her book is a rather sledgehammer one, but it has some very important points to make. But I'd like to sort of look in a different direction. Uh, uh, from discursive formation that is monolithic, again to history. I think what we need to do, and what would be most compelling for the center to study and, and focus more historically in the future, is look more carefully at the creation, for instance, of grammars and translations by missionaries. There's a lot of involvement. This is not only discursive formation that has come from without, but has had a variety of indigenous participations from within traditions. The work of scholar civil servants in a variety of contexts where there is more than one example of one might term reverse missionizing, where the missionary or Western outsider becomes an advocate or is converted in one way or another to the views of those he or she seeks to supplant or dominate. This kind of indigenous influence, um, Charles Hallisey has called intercultural mimesis, that part of the history of the encounter, the, the reification of world religions, the classification of world or nature, ethical, primitive, or national religions has gone on in a dialogue, and often with those who have participated in this dialogue. Um, indigenous influences go towards um, normative uh, definition. Again, Halsey's article on uh, Rice David's discovery of the polytext of the rational core of Theravada Buddhism, construction of a religion, was influenced in many ways not only by some kind of Protestant Buddhism from the outside, but indigenous monastic informants who had a reified notion, had a rather rationalized notion of their own tradition that was relatively alienated from um, uh, local rites, devotional rites, um, and lay uh, practices, life cycle ceremonies. There were elective infinities, and there often are, between positivistic historiography of European Orientalism and some indigenous Buddhist styles of self-representation. So looking at the, the complex historical uh, relationship between these definitions um, and these uh, great discursive formations would be something that's a very important thing for us to consider. Also looking just at world religions at the center. I went through an archive of old center bulletins. I actually uh, I gathered several that were about to be thrown away when I left the center at a certain point. So I've had these. They go back to 1974. Um, it is true that for most of the history of the center, the great five, the great seven, the great eight, <coughs> what, however you sort of slice it, have been the focus of uh, the center's work. You know, primarily so Hindu, Hinduism and Judaism also, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, uh, Zoroastrian, African Native American traditions as generically defined. But actually, when you look at what projects have been done by people in the community, by scholars who have been there, quite a variegated bunch, um, quite a lot of variety, also within the traditions, quite a lot of variety of Islamic scholars, Muslim scholars, have done their work at the center. Um, of course, particularly after Professor Sullivan became director, you had a focus on South American and African living 
traditions, not only something that's primal or archaic in a generalized sense. So if you look at the, the span of the center's work, in fact, um, constantly the boundaries of these world religions, reified traditions, are broken down by the people who have done their work here. Okay, if you go back in terms of, of what, what uh, is an important thing to consider in our discussions here is not only the center in the abstract, the center is a kind of philosophical construct, but the community of scholars that have done their work here. Overarching uh, elements here for me, and I, I guess I follow John Carmen here very much, and along with uh, Lauren Sullivan and Don Swearer, I think for the center, the best sort of approach to the future, the best approach to, um, in a sense, um, uh, breaking down the boundaries between uh, uh, reified world religions, etc., is a focus on strong cross-cultural comparative themes. Uh, comparative themes in the study of religion that, uh, and finding key themes in the phrase of Claude Levi Strauss, and this is picked up by Jay Z Smith, that are good to think with. These themes do not shut out good conversation, but like in Paul Ricoeur's symbols, they give rise to thought. The best use of comparative themes love, death, evil, pilgrimage, the body, humanity, and the human does not naively presuppose universal experiences or univocal topologies across cultures or religions but generates sometimes surprising new questions, incongruities, juxtapositions, that on occasion, in a seminar or classroom or CSWR symposium conversation, generate fresh insights and sometimes strange and unexpected contiguities. I think this kind of notion of religiousness and a colloquy of particularities, to use um, uh, Wilfred Smith's term. Colloquy, in the, not in the, sense, uh, in the sense that it's not just dialogue or a dialectical relation to two people, but it's sort of a generalized conversation um, that follows a, what Ponikar might call a dialogical dialogue. The particularity of traditions, tribal traditions, of ritual traditions may indeed be the overarching reality that we deal with in this, in this world. There may be no common patterns that arise. But in conversation, even the tensions are important to kind of rise up out of a conversation. And an intellectual one at the center. So uh, I want to mention a couple more models of contemporary scholarship and address particularly the issues of, of where we might go thematically. Um, in terms of recent studies that really uh, move me and I think uh, uh, go in this direction of breaking up the boundaries, uh, John, uh, Jean de Bernardi's study, The Way That Lives in the Heart, rich study of Chinese popular spirit, uh, for lack of a better word, spirit religion, popular religion, spiritual uh, mediums, vernacular religious narratives that focus on luck, power, the fragility of luck, power, wealth and prosperity in Chinese communities. And particularly her, her focus on spirit religions has some very intriguing things to say about Weberian theories about Confucianism. And her argument is very much about spirit cults as the very entrepreneurial ethos that most informs the spirit of Chinese capitalism. So ghosts, spirits, ancestor worship, something that would draw in a global Christianity um, as a practice would be, these are themes I think that would get us on the ground and thinking um, in, in uh, very interesting ways. Lior Halevi's Muhammad's Grave is another recent uh, book. A book that's on the development of early Islam, but a book that focuses on what? Death practices, burial practices, treatments of the body. There he gets in through these practices, notions of gender, and the body, corpse washing, sh shroud breathing, and something that interests me in terms of the comparative theme that links with gender, women's laments, lament traditions, funeral practices. Um, what he's able to do in this book, in a way, is you don't talk about Sunni or Shi'i, you don't talk about a variety of very crude ways of dividing uh, a, a variety of Muslim persons who moved in different ways and different points of uh, contact in the Mediterranean and Arabia and Mesopotamia. But in focusing on quotidian matters like death rites, the burial of the dead, saint shrines and laments, gets at the heart of a complex uh, uh, concept of religion. Also something that I would, I would like to be able to, to talk a bit about is literary genres. Using Sheldon Pollock's notion of literary cultures, um, what is lacking in Sheldon Pollock's project on literary cultures in South Asia, on uh, literary formations, is, is religion. What is the uh, element here? What is the part played by religious literatures in sort of a global uh, reach of particular kinds of um, literary genres? I work on Sandesha Kavyas, or messenger poems, in South Indian Sri Lanka. 
poems that were written, a genre shared by Hindu and Buddhist poets. By focusing on a single genre of, of uh, poetry, of literary production, it crosses religious boundaries and crosses regions. We can learn a lot about uh, uh, discursive forms, again, break down boundaries between things that we're so used to hearing now, like Sinhalese Buddhism, Sinhala Buddhism, Tamil Buddhism, or ta Tamil Hinduism, uh, rather. And so uh, focusing on those. A focus on lives of the Buddha alone in different vernacular languages throughout the world would break, do very much to break down our sense of that there's one sort of coherent, rational core Buddhism. And one more uh, uh, thing that I just thought of the other day in talking with my colleague at uh, Swarthmore, K. David Harrison, who some of you may know, works on Endangering Languages projects. Now, da uh, David doesn't have any kind of sympathy at all towards religion or religiousness. He's working with folks in very small communities whose languages are about to disappear from the world. He talks about the ecology of language and the survival of certain what, sensibilities in the world. Now, I think a wonderful dialogue with what the work he's doing on languages and communities and disappearing languages in religion would also be a very fecund area here. All this to break down boundaries. But another point, a final point I want to make about directions is that I think indeed, I think all of us realize we're living in an age of the reification of religion. Um, unfortunately, and you read Wilfred uh, Campbell Smith's Toward a World Theology, he's seeing this beginning to disappear. He's seeing a recurrence of history leading towards sort of a common sense of things. I think we're surrounded by reified religions and a re the renewal of the notion of bounded communities. And I think the center, I think we need to uh, uh, focus on these kinds of things. The, gener the generation of, I would say, Pentecostal Christianity that has a single notion of what is true, going back to this old notion of religio, uh, and others that are not going to have participate in that sal salvific life because they don't believe in this tradition. The potency of, uh, of reified religion is around all of us, whether it's the Hindu rite or recent pronouncements of Pope uh, Benedict and the kind of real sort of um, awkward way in which he can deals with Islam, etc. Um, we're, we, we, we're living in this time of reification, and I think the center needs to focus on this. Reified creedal religion is, survives well in online blogs and other forms of cyberspace. Focus on cyberspace, focus on the internet as a center, not only, and I think we can see a lot of, kind of local vernacular, translocal and transnational practices, forms of religiousness on the internet, but also I think we uh, can see very well how Traditions are generated in opposition to others. So cyberspace is an important new textual uh, place that the center um, might put some effort into. As for cyberspace imaginaries, it can be argued, for instance, after a reading of Brian Axel's fine work, that Khalistan, the separate Sikh state, already exists and has existed now for some time, virtually, on Sikh nationalist websites. Cyberspace can turn religious aspiration into material reality. The center would do well to focus on these virtual materials and all their complexity. Visceral modes of, of appraisal, as William Connolly uh, calls them. Also, I note here Charles Hirschkind's study of what he calls the sensorium, cassette culture or CD culture uh, in uh, modern Cairo. Uh, the impact of sermons on CDs with people, again, in transmission of a religious, not actually religiousness, but religion itself uh, into people's ears, literally. So with that, I'll end uh, with a few things that uh, are on my mind in terms of directions, and I can take some questions. Um, well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be able to chair a panel that has such wonderful talks in it. Uh, we have a few moments for comments or discussion questions. I haven't heard anything yet about apocalyptic, uh, well, you talked about reification, mm -hmm. and I think you might have also talked about politicization as this, yes. such, but apocalyptic tendencies in religion today, which are dangerous to the uh, survival of mankind. I mean, we are getting there into an area which uh, could prepare people, could create a certain submissiveness, uh, willingness to accept what is about to happen as foreordained, 
that sort of idea, which uh, I think should be looked at. It's a side of religio that, bond, that, uh, that separates in that sense, too. And I think that's important. I think that why I, was, uh, I have a variety of examples here is that the tendency in the past, let's say, thinking about the Center for Study World Religions, and I, I reread Wilfred's book, which is actually, toward a world theology, is most amazingly both radical and cr I mean, th there are things that he says that are so, I mean, still so uh, really uh, quite striking. But over and again, the optimism. We're heading into this area, and again, the optimism may have a certain point of the 60s when the center was established. That such a colloquy or conversation among persons in an intellectual environment can actually create a kind of conflict. I think that's true in many ways, but I think what we also have to see is religion is a, time, is a rather negative force now in the world around us, too. I don't and see anything division. to be optimistic about. Well, some, uh, you know, I'm sympathetic there, and I, I often struggle my, myself with, with the idea of, as a scholar of religion, my subject matter, I find, more and more in my own heart, let's say. I mean, I love literature, or lit, or poetry. Religion seems to be more and more, as I've you know, moved forward in my career as a classroom, be something that is, I mean, again, it's a great thing to share with folks, and as, a te as something to teach. But we're dealing with dangerous things here, dangerous forces that divide people's minds, uh, divide people's communities. And I think that's another aspect that the center as an Iranic space, needs also, um, we all need to, to talk about this a bit more, also as scholars. Another comment, question? <coughs> we will also have a few moments at the end as well, uh, so we can return to some of the show. I, yeah, I had a whole thing about the, the table and being you know, together, but even the notion of the center as a table, you know, when you, when you meet with people, you cook and eat together, you also argue. You sing, you argue. Uh, the kind of the ruckus <coughs> element of eating together and being together. We can do that over lunch. Herman Sun points your sister. Our third speaker today is an equally distinguished uh, scholar. Really happy to have Hen de Vries here who is currently at John Hopkins University, where he is professor in the Humanities Center and the Department of Philosophy. He's been there uh, since 2003, and, he's also, um, oh, yeah, and, and he is also director of the Humanities Center. Uh, prior to that, uh, Professor DeVries was at the, um, he, he held the chair of metaphysics and its history in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Amsterdam where he continues to hold a research position as, I like this title very much, Professor Ordinarius <laughs> of Systematic Philosophy and the Philosophy of Religion. He was a co-founder of the Amsterdam School of, uh, for Cultural Analysis as well, which is an interdisciplinary research institute. Uh, he received his PhD in Philosophy of Religion from the University of Leiden in 1989. And I just want to read to you the titles of a couple of his uh, publications, which include uh, Philosophy and the Turn to Religion, um, 1999, uh, Religion and Violence, Philosophical Perspectives from Kant to Derrida, uh, 2002, Minimal Theologies, Critiques of Secular Reason in Theodore uh, Adorno and Emmanuel Levinas, um, 2005, uh, and he is also the co-editor of Violence, Identity, and Self-Determination, and also of Religion and Media. Uh, so we're really happy to have you here, and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for a lovely introduction. I would like to begin by thanking Donald Swear and Frank Clooney for their kind invitation to participate in these celebrations. It is a pleasure and honor to be back here, and I have a feeling of deep gratitude for the time I was fortunate to spend at the center. The mentorship of Larry Sullivan um, and our common project on political theology, which included a co-sponsored workshop in the Netherlands and across the street here, but also the, the larger intellectual work and thinking and conversation the CSWR community has inspired in me over the years has been tremendously important for my work. In my remarks this morning, I would like to raise a simple, 
yet in my mind also somewhat daunting question. Namely, what might it mean to include in the study and category of world politics the more recent and, it seems, more broader discussion of the global, as in, say, global religions? The two fields of study, world religions and global religions, are already vast and surely could be said to vastly, perhaps even completely, overlap. But more than a terminological issue or preference is at stake in deploying the category of the global. And perhaps the center's challenge will be, and has always been, to situate religion within the life world, the public domain, and the emerging debate on globalization, global religions, perhaps even the very meaning of what global entails or might come to me. Now, recent collections on so-called global religions in the plural, edited, for example, by Mark Jugendsmeyer, seem to offer a fresh approach to this phenomenon that interests me here. These studies that I'm quoting <coughs> seek to think globally about religion. They query religion in a global age, <coughs> in global perspective. They investigate the global future of religion, the global resurgence of religion, the global religious scene. And against this background, even discuss the implications of an opposed tendency, which would be that of anti-global religion. But they do not so much concentrate on the structural features of globality that interest me more here but instead present themselves as guides to understanding, quote, the state of worldwide religion in the 21st century, while emphasizing the diversity, indeed plurality, of religions, even or especially today. So these studies wisely shun the temptation and risks of generalization and abstraction, and devote their pages not only to the, the three major monotheisms of the so-called Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but also to Hinduism, Buddhism, African religion, and local religious societies. As such, they again wisely document and ratify the need to ever broaden our historical and empirical scope before making any further claims about the meaning and role, or end, of religion in the modern world. They further demonstrate that if the concept of world religions has in the meantime proved to be somewhat suspect, and we can discuss the reasons why, then the very location of religious culture, of religious cultures of the world, with the help of, say, geographical maps and territorial designations, in short, of map and territory, seems ever more perilous and perhaps always was. Here's a quote from one of these volumes on global religions. Um, and this is Mark Lucas-Meyer in his introduction. Today it seems that almost everyone is everywhere. Scarcely any region in the globe today consists solely of members of a single strand of traditional religion. In an era of globalization, the pace of cultural interaction and change has increased by seemingly exponential expansions of degrees. This fluid process of cultural interaction, expansion, synthesis, borrowing, and change has been going on from the earliest moment of recorded history. Religion, therefore, has always been global, in the sense that religious communities and traditions have always maintained permeable boundaries. They have moved, shifted, and interacted with one another around the globe. If one thinks of religion as the cultural expression of a people's sense, of ultimate significance, a definition, by the way, I just add here in parentheses, one may well dispute. <laughs> it is understandable that these cultural elements would move as people have moved, and that they would ha interact and change over time just as people have. Though most religious traditions claim some ultimate anchors of truth that are unchangeable, it is indisputable that every tradition contains within it 
an enormous diversity of characteristics and myriad cultural elements gleaned from its neighbors. All this is part of the globalization of religion. Religion is global in that it is related to the global transportation of peoples and of ideas." End of quote. Now, clearly, amassing historical and empirical, even statistic information about these forms of globalization in Jürgen Zmeier's rendition of diasporas, of transnational religion, and of religion in plural societies, is more necessary and useful than ever before. An infinite task, nothing less. And yet the turn or return to the religious on a global scale and the accompanying and enabling emptying out of its very concept, if not always practice, that is, that I think comes with it and continues to make it ever more plausible to explain and interpret and read these accelerating tendencies towards its growth intensification and diversification. This whole tendency merits to be studied from other methodological, theoretical, and more precisely philosophical, I would venture to say, metaphysical angles as well. Now, can these philosophical, metaphysical, or let me throw in another term yet, theological, political um, elements um, be clarified, be hammered out? The terminology here matters less than the matter at hand, which is that there is a deep pragmatic sense in which religions and their virtually omnipresent and increasingly mediatized archives of doctrines and rites, sensibilities and visions, go on to exert an ever greater hold over the life worlds and public domains of multiple modernities across the globe. This may call for, quote, deep learning across religious boundaries, as Professor Clooney proposes in his most recent book. It may also express a sense of deep pluralism, as my colleague and good friend Bill Connolly often says. And deep pragmatism is simply a term and thought, call it a mindset or interpretive practice, that I would like to add to the mix. But there is a further sense that global religions grasp our imagination in ways that in a somewhat speculative and hypothetical meaning of the term is are strangely global. But again, what does that mean? As Webster's English Dictionary reminds us, the, global, the term global does not just signify what it is commonly taken to mean, namely having the shape of a globe, spherical. It also has two other meanings which we tend to use much more rarely, but which I want to bring out a little bit more fully here, not least since it is precisely these more abstract connotations that seem to me essential in understanding what global religion, perhaps in contradistinction here with world religions, might right now mean, in addition to the obvious. Global, Webster says, citing the moral philosopher Alan Gwith, also conjures up broad and universal, such as in a phrase like a philosophy which takes a global view. Further, it connotes, interestingly, homogeneous, not admitting a choice, or finally, marked by absence of particularizing detail, simple and highly undifferentiated, end of quote. So, stretching the point a bit, one might say, that a religion is global in that it becomes virtually absolute. That is to say, quite literally, absolves itself from the very situation and context, and that would mean history, identity, and culture, in which it originates, and in which it remains in part, no doubt, deeply, deeply steep as well. Given the etymological sense of the word absolute, namely from the Latin absolver, a global religion is absolute in that it loosens its ties from the very horizons of interpretation, the supposed Sitz im Leben, from which it first emerged and whose conceptual and structural elements as well as forms of life are subsequently translated and transformed 
into different situations and contexts, not its own. Yet to the two perspectives on global religion, Jugendmeier's and the one distilled and advocated here, do these, two, these two perspectives on global religion do not so much contradict as they complement or supplement each other. In the era of globalization, religion seems to call not only for a minute study of its more material elements and spiritual forms, in short, its words and things, gestures and powers, sounds and silences, affects and effects, but also, and perhaps most of all, for a more theoretical, indeed philosophical, and as I suggested, metaphysical, if deeply pragmatic analysis of the widest possible meaning and greatest likely impact that each single one of its terms and terminologies can acquire almost overnight and with the blink of an eye across temporal and spatial zones without reason or adequate cause. This is what religion's translation and transformation, formalization and universalization, but conversely also its reification and commodification have come down to in the present day and age. A global religion in more than one sense of the word that is as a now saturated and then again negative phenomenon of an increasingly expensive and empty, vague, often fuzzy kind. Such a change of perspective can, I believe, provide fresh insights into the more protected yet highly volatile processes of provenization. More precisely, of a, simultaneously, of a simultaneous intensification and trivialization, or a maximize, maximization and minimization of the phenomenon, each of which contradict the various assumption of an undisturbed and fairly linear narrative of the progressive secularization of our world, or age, and which may well elude the accumulation of mere empirical data and statistics alone, even though it is not without telling examples, and hence some otherwise demonstrative evidence or indicative testimony of its own. Indeed, its signs are written all over the walls, symbolical and other, walls that have been erected or that we erect ourselves to, to, to box in our views of and access to the real. Now what emerges from this picture is a global and globalized religion, but one that in its very expansion, that is as it extends to virtually all the different segments of a more and more rationalized and differentiated life world, inevitably affects and inflects the processes of consultation and deliberation on which de liberal democratic societies pride themselves. This, if nothing else, already explains the resurgence of public religions in the modern world, as Jose Casanova diagnosed them some years ago, or rather of global religions, as others have added. And I think that this shift in terminology from public or world to global, as in the transition from world and public religions to global religions, says something about the current nature of an increasingly shared or common, if often divisive, agonistic or even antagonistic sphere, for which modern designations such as the public domain, or even the social and cultural, indeed life world, may no longer be adequate just as identity or culture may no longer be what truly matters. As indicated, and unlike the reference to the secular and social, cultural, or political realm, terms that like world religion and public religion might seem to retain, the modifying global gestures towards the merely global, that is the minimally theological or practical ritual and liturgical, spiritual and aesthetic sense of what religion once meant, or more interestingly, may still or yet again become to me, come to me. This is not to say that this merely global conception and manifestation makes lesser or fewer things possible as things now stand. Indeed, 
The opposite is often the case. But an altogether different logic of proportion and effect, indeed a logic of inverse magnitudes, as Peter Brown said of the later Augustine's attempt to come to terms with relics and the belief in miracles, seems ever more prominent and called for. Now, is that the type of question, and as I said, logic, that we could imagine the center to pursue in the coming years? If the religious and theological legacies are no longer mastering their current valence without quite having faded into oblivion, far from it, what use could we still have for the religious idiom as a tool or resource to describe and interpret current worldwide trends that are already affected by them, even more perhaps than these affect them in turn? And why risk this even more excessive expression, namely global religion, in order to capture religions, however displaced, diffused, and disseminated, hence diminished yet abiding presence, whose renewed significance marks our time more than anything else. What else could explain religious, religion's resurgence but an analysis of the paradox, perhaps aporia, of the global in the two senses, we have introduced earlier, that is, of the virtually everywhere and nowhere to be found. For one thing, speaking of global religion in a professional and pro programmatic manner might testify to the most accurate and topical, relevant and responsible responses to the simultaneous diversification and, as it were, homogenization of public spheres and life roles said to be taking place today. These tendencies, I have suggested, affect the meaning and categories of world and of the public domain in comparable ways. But be that as it may, whatever way we turn things, wherever we turn our investigative gaze, there is, it seems undeniable, at once more and less of religion. And we haven't quite grasped what this means, how it has come about, and what consequences worldwide, and especially globally, no less than culturally or existentially, this may have for the immediate and more distant futures. However, what seems unique, unprecedented, is that for all the emptying out of its doctrinal content, moral substance, and ritual thickness, religion manifests itself all over again. That is to say, interestingly, almost in total, in every single one of its relevant aspects, and principally and practically independent of geographical, social, and cultural, worldly, or public context. It does so not only, or not so much in fragments, remainders, and traces, which indeed, again, undeniably are everywhere, but in all of its traditional orthodoxy, no less than heterodoxy, its age-old iconoclasm, no less than its modern contestation of idolatry, its invocation of divine speech, as much as in its condemnation and its time use of blasphemy. It is this virtual totality in concluding, that is to say, it's the near integrality as well as near integrity of religion's whole corpus that gives itself to be seen and heard or felt, but always and everywhere channeled, that is to say, filtered and refracted through the lens of events whose origin, meaning, and sometimes quite specular, indeed special effects, strike many moderns and secularists as deeply troubling and violent, while they impress post-secularists, or more precisely, deep pragmatists, as being at times strangely full of promise, even of hope. As a consequence, what seems a quasi-automatic feature of modernization is not so much secularization, but on the contrary, the regeneration, the creative evolution or production, if you like, of religion. What we are witnessing is not just a turning into a commodity, and indeed mechanism or automatism of the sincerest beliefs, but the simultaneous slippage of media-driven aspects of make-believe into the no less compelling elements and forms of a belief in the making. Thank you for a very challenging...
and provocative talk with uh, some comments or questions. Thank you, Tim. I, so, I actually think the raising the question of, of the impact of the global and particularly the scope of globalization and its particularity is very interesting to put in uh, contest intellectually with the idea of the world. Um, but I was puzzled by the assertion of the what shall I say, the emptying out, I guess, of the idea of religious specificity and content, particularly in connection to what we've heard before, uh, and, and really in, in, in connection to the drift in the last decade or 20 years of emphasizing and highlighting the particularities, albeit sometimes very new and very, uh, very much changed particularities that distinguish religious practice uh, as we look at it in historical specificity. So I'm, I, I, I'm puzzled how to put those two together. I, I mean, I get the drift of globalization and the homogenization of, um, of, of structures of culture, modes of speech, languages, et cetera. I mean, I think we can carry on a great length about that, but I'm, I'm not clear that the evidence for the eradication of particularity, the less of religion that you emphasize, is, is really present or documented. So I wonder if you can comment a bit more on right. what's at stake in that. Right. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And uh, it's not at all obvious to me that, it's, that it can actually uh, be, be worked out. But let, let me put all the cards on the table. Yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to take together is uh, what one could call, uh, as a student of, let's say, 20th century uh, um, German and French philosophy, perhaps this begins all in the 19th century, post, post Hegel, as it were, uh, is a certain um, secularization, provenization of, of religious categories. For example, to just make the argument very quick, uh, uh, if, if in, in Western philosophy, European philosophy of, of that period, we speak of, of redemption or even of consensus right, and the models that it finds, we have um, a secular, uh, uh, profane rendition, translation, transformation, emptying out of what arguably redemption meant in the uh, traditional theologies that, with which we are uh, familiar. So that's one thing. So that, my suggestion was that if one reads actually through a whole corpus of, of, of thinkers, the um, Frankfurt School, the Habermasians, and, and, and what have you, you see that, interestingly, that they side with, with Max Weber on the one hand, and uh, like Weber, but differently, more radically, insist on a certain uh, continuation of religious theological tropes. So there is a, um, a simultaneously um, diminishing and abiding presence of religious category. That's the emptying out, and somehow I concluded that, lo and behold, the uh, enlightenment project of uh, secularizing religious thought, um, whether it knows it or not, likes it or not, uh, is deeply steeped in a minimal theology. Now, that being said, um, recent developments in recent decennia, the, the resurgence of, of religion, the return of religion, whatever way you call and describe it, um, manifests something seemingly completely different, namely, uh, as if the, the total archive, or the virtual totality of the religious archive, uh, almost overnight by one stroke, can become fully available or proclaimed acclaimed in, in, in different contexts. Um, in the heart of, let's say, Western Europe, or United States, or, or wherever. Um, so then the question becomes now, how does one think this inevitable emptying out that was uh, part of the Western legacy, uh, the disenchantment of the world in one formulation. How can we think this together with this uh, renewed emphasis on, on, on globality? And one way, one way to do this, and I think this is what the center has done all along, and what the whole project of studying world religions uh, meant in part, was uh, to pay 
tribute and attention to the, the wide variety of, of particulars uh, in historical uh, terms, in terms of culture and identity. And uh, one cannot do that enough or, uh, or long enough. And uh, so that's, but then there is a sense that I don't feel that speaking of global religions in that more colloquial or obvious way uh, exhausts all the interpretive challenges that we are uh, faced with. So how does the emptying out go together with the, um, the current availability of the totality of the religious archive? And now some thinkers have, have um, offered some suggestions. Uh, you know, a very tiny text of an author that I'm mostly not that fond of, but uh, by, uh, by Giorgio Agamben on uh, Le Dispositif, on, on the apparatus, where he basically says, you know, since we were talking genealogy, you want to understand genealogy in the Foucauldian sense, you basically have to go to the church fathers. That's where this, 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 this positio basically finds uh, its first articulation. Uh, but we can also think of the debate that I was very much intrigued by uh, between, uh, well, maybe not between, but the reception that, for example, uh, Jeffrey Stout gives of, of Brendan's work, uh, this volume on, uh, on radical interpretation, where it would somehow seem that uh, all these deba debates about religion in the public domain require us to, to, to think through what uh, comprehensive doctrines uh, and overlapping consensus might, might mean. And uh, the discussions that have been going on in the Kantian tradition, as it were, post Habermas post roles may not be sufficient to somehow uh, map, map that out. But uh, the becoming worldly of religion, I would say, is always a moment of ascesis, kenosis, and emptying out. Thank you. Well, so many interesting issues you opened up, but I, I thought it was a, a very interesting way to take threads that were already sewn uh, or put out and weave them together uh, on boundaries, on reification. And so then you ask us to look at the simultaneous diversification of these themes uh, and, and at the same time their homogenization or the paradox of having a uh, and a more intense regard for the local religions or the local culture at the same time as a risk of emptying or evacuating their meaning by giving them a more global extension. So I, I thought it was a very keen analysis of that um, very paradoxical process. I wanted to ask you um, just a very basic question, almost stepping back to uh, a naive distance. How do you decide to evaluate the return of religion one way or the other. Is, is the return of religion an apparent return that, um, you know, for one may, may or may not be deeply genuine, that's one way, way it could be apparent, or is it apparent because it never left and it just the elites, uh, those of us who study them in an intellectual way, and have hidden agendas of our own inclining one way or the other in the formation of our categories, which I think is what was put out have rediscovered them on our horizon, but they, they, it's apparent because it really never left the scene. How do you decide uh, in, to take a position on that first matter? Again, this is an excellent and difficult question. Uh, somehow I'm not satisfied with the, the response that, um, that for example, uh, Hans Joas gave, uh, the critical response to, uh, to Habermas's rediscovery of, of religion and the continued importance uh, of religion in the public domain, also in his debate with uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger. And Hans Joas's claim is basically uh, if Habermas comes upon with this notion, uh, comes upon this notion of the post-secular, basically this is a corrective, indeed uh, good for intellectuals who were just kind of staring the wrong way all along. <laughs> and somehow I feel that that uh, diminishes the, again, the challenge or the, or the difficulty of, 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 of the problem. So uh, I don't think that uh, it helps at all. And I think most social theorists, I hope I'm not insulting anyone here, but most social theorists have, including Habermas, uh, but also someone like Manuel Castells in his, his trilogy, have often thought of the, um, the return or resurgence of religion on a worldwide scale as reactive phenomena, as, um, as uh, oppositions to, as it were, uh, trends towards modernization and globalization. And again, I don't think that that's in, in, in helpful suggestion. So 
the, the wager is basically, so what if we were to think about this completely differently? Namely that uh, uh, there are not just bits and pieces that are left and that are now, as it were, uh, overinterpreted or uh, jumped upon by uh, marginalized groups and uh, thrown back into the face of uh, Western enlightened elites. Uh, there is a simultaneous, as it were, uh, emptying out and virtual presence of the, uh, the totality of, of religion's archive. And um, for, for, for good and for ill, which means that why not attempt to wager that uh, all these religious categories and tropes, uh, including uh, the apocalypse, um, allow one to, uh, to read things both, both ways. So the, the, the propensity towards good and evil, uh, the havoc, but also the, the, the challenges, challenges and possibilities that they can open up, I would say are uh, equi primordial. Right? Uh, one cannot really decide in advance which way things uh, will, will turn. So, yes, so the religious archives was always there uh, since the past is always there. And there are pragmatic contexts in which um, we or others can access that past in, uh, in a near total sense. So we don't need to think even in terms of, let's say, religion now taking the shape of a postmodern bricolage. Uh, something else is, 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 is at stake, even though that no doubt happens as well. One more question um, in the back here. Thank you, Mehmet Galchin is my name. I've heard uh, great things, but one thing I was hoping to hear was what role religion may play in conflict resolution globally, and what role may the center uh, have toward that end? Because as uh, life becomes more difficult, it seems people turn to God, to religion, and I think it works in cycles. And uh, as our world is facing so many new challenges, I believe there is an upsurge of interest in religion. And I think that religion can play a very important role in conflict resolution and in hopefully negotiating peace. If you could have uh, some words on that. Yeah. Thank you. I have no concrete answer. Uh, to that question, um, but one could say that to the extent that the conflicts that, that worry us um, have to do with some tension between, let's say, uh, uh, modernity and religion, or, or science and religion, or uh, quote unquote Western democracy and the presence of religion, um, one could say that trying to begin by leveling the playing field. Uh, by insisting on the uh, perhaps more complicated distribution of faith and knowledge um, than we are often uh, uh, accepting would be, would be a good start. Um, and then, secondly, I think that uh, there's a host of religious figures, tropes, uh, that uh, have much more thought and energy uh, and, and, and time uh, invested in them so that they allow, I think, us to unpack and, and simply learn. I think that one of the reasons that the religious archive has the, uh, finds the interest that it, that, it, that it does is that it's basically uh, one of the longest archives around. So anyone who has any interest in conflict revolution resolution or um, in uh, thinking through what it would mean to, to live together, uh, what it would mean to think about uh, existential, social, and political questions, would be well advised to just study and begin, begin right there. But I have no uh, one, uh, let's say, best case example uh, or best case scenario that, that would just 
perhaps respond to your, your question. Well, I want to thank all three of the speakers uh, for actually raising